and green, and uh, but very focused anyway. Um, we have a heavy agenda. First of all, we are doing Zoom because of the, uh, you know, prerequisite from the governor. And we don't know what that will change. I mean, probably for the, the board, it will not change until September. Uh, and um, we are very, so you are, rec you are being recorded, you're on Zoom and, um, we are. We have a pretty heavy agenda, so I'm going to try to stick to the time here, and a very interesting agenda. I don't know whether I can see the. Um, do I see? Oh, a lot of participants. Very exciting, and um, a, a lot of different projects. So the first thing I'd like to do is welcome the the Department of Design and Construction to give us some updates on um, multiple projects. And I'd like that to be no more than, you know, 15 minutes and then five minutes of Q&A, if possible. Um, hi, can you hear me? I'm having a little yes. problem with my camera. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sophia Noboa. I'm the CCL for uh, the Gansborough Reconstruction Project. Um, CCL. Yes, I'm the CCL, Community Construction. What is, what is a CCL? <laughs> I'm sorry. The CCL is a Community Construction uh, Liaison. Good. Uh, with the, we have another member here uh, with the community. So basically what I do is I liaise within the community, businesses, um, the other agencies as DOT, um, DEP. We coordinate um, everything that it has to do with uh, with the operations that we do around the neighborhood. So um, our project extends from, uh, from West 16th Street. Which uh, project? We have three projects on the agenda. Sorry. I apologize. Um, I'm sorry. So our project is DDC HWMP 2020. So it's a reconstruction of 9th Avenue. And no, the not 9. I'm sorry? Not Ninth Avenue. You we are Seventh Avenue. No, we're Ninth Avenue. We don't have Ninth Avenue on the. You are talking about Gansworth? Yes, we are Gansworth Reconstruction. Oh, all right. Yeah. If you could talk in a language that we understand, that'd be great. Like, you know, <laughs> those project numbers are a little bit uh, abstract. Oh, when you said DDC, that's what I thought that it was me. No, it is. But I mean, the name of the project. Uh, yeah. Okay. So basically, the uh, the update that we uh, that we have, um, I'm uh, glad to announce that we're almost coming to an end. Uh, the com the substantial completion date is going to be June thirtieth. Wow. Uh, currently, the contractor is working at the intersection of West Sixteenth Street and Ninth Avenue, uh, with the restoration of the roadway. Uh, we completed gas main water main installations. Um, we also finished everything that it has to do with sidewalk, crosswalks. Um, we just have a punch list items, which is um, some lights, uh, installation of uh, lining, some traffic lights, and, uh, that, and then that's about it. Now we only have a, our main issue and the reason that our project was delayed was all the interferences that we had with Connecticut along the way. Like, um, so that is, it's been for pretty much three years in delay. Uh, but the only thing that is left is at the Northwest corner of West 16th street and 9th Avenue is the electrical manhole um, that is actually currently being worked on. They are um, they're gonna basically reconstruct the whole the entire manhole. Uh, that is not inside the scope of our project. So with that said, with that being said, is our project is gonna end on June thirtieth. Then Con Edison is gonna take over uh, for that manhole. So I think we have a representative from Con Edison here if you have any questions about that. Who is the, the representative of Con Ed? 
Hi, good, af good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Williams and I'm with Con Edison. Okay, do you have an update on that? Um, so thanks, Sophia, for explaining where everything is. And just to piggyback on what Sophia explained, there is a manhole at that intersection that Con Edison has to complete work on and that will be extending beyond the June 30th date. Um, there were issues in which led to us not being able to do, finish the work along with the job. So there's- well, What's the going, completion date for you? The completion date? Well, that depends on whether or not we are allowed to do work Monday through Friday, but it's going to be able to, we're hoping to be able to complete it by mid to late July. Uh, and when you say being able to work Monday through Friday, what do you mean? What it depends on the stipulations that are received from the Department of Transportation when additional permits are applied for. So it's also not, once we get the additional permits, we'll know what, so what are the hours? Can actually work. What are the time and the hours that you are requesting? We don't request specific times and hours. We put in for the ability to work at a certain location and the DOT based on the area and their consideration decides but what yeah, times and hours you can work. We can request. So what are the hours that would work for you? Monday through Friday, daytime stipulations would be great. From what time to what time? seven to three, eight to four. I'm not trying to determine what the city will give, but just, you know, a standard day, Monday through Friday would be, would help us get the work done a lot quicker. Okay, all right. Any question from anyone on uh, this topic? Do you just a quick question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm because I ride my bike that area when they're doing construction, things are very bumpy and things like that. The, uh, when you put down the, um, I don't know what you call them on the street, could you at least have, and I, this is repetitive for Christine, I know that, but um, the rubber around it, so it's smooth riding rather than a choppy, it seems where every time there's construction, not just with Con Ed, but with everyone, it just she, it leaves a mess for the street. But wait a minute, she said, uh, Kimberly said that the construction is going to be on the northwest side, which is not the bike lane. Okay, I stand corrected. Okay, all right. And then did you see anything else on that intersection is going to be finished properly with the bike lane, etc.? Yes, once uh, the roadway is being completed and uh, they're going to do the marking on the street, then we'll absolutely um, open the bike lane um, and they will do everything that needs to be done under the uh, specs okay. of the AT. All right. So uh, thank you for this update. So what's the next update we have? Yeah, well, thanks. 7th Christine. Avenue. I, Christine, I see one hand up in the public. I don't know. I'm if it's sorry, I, oh, I didn't see that. Eric, I don't know if Eric has a question about this topic. I'm moving him over. I don't see him. How come I don't see him? Oh, hey, uh, so, sorry about that. Uh, took hey, a second to join. Um, just, just my usual um, uh, wine. If we're going to approve something for Con Ed, I thought it was a usual um, practice of this board to require that they uh, be caught up on their, their idling fines. It looks like they owe money on about 70 of them right now. Um, but just, um, just going to throw that in there. 68. 68, that's a lot. Okay. Um, I mean, in fact, they shouldn't be starting the job until they pay those, right? So and they usually get around to them, but. Okay. So who is presenting the next item, which is department design proposed water main project on 7th Avenue? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Zoe Wu, I'm from DDC Design. I'll be sharing the screen for a brief PowerPoint. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us at this meeting to present the upcoming DDC project, MED669. This is a distribution water main replacement project in the borough of Manhattan. I'm Zoe Wu, I'm the design engineer of this project, and I'm here with design engineer in charge, Mohammed Rahman, um, design executive director, Jorge Tua, as well as BDC community outreach team. This project will replace the distribution water mains along the 7th Avenue between West 14th Street and West 34th Street, including the side streets between 6th Avenue and 8th Avenue, as highlighted on the map. This project is located in the community boards four and five neighborhood and the project areas within community number four are boxed in blue at the lower right of the map, which is from 14th Street to 26th Street between 6th and 8th Avenue. The existing distribution water main system along the 7th Avenue was installed in the late 1800s. It was discovered that the corridor has many defective faults which may create water pressure and water quality problems when shut down. In order to improve the water distribution and fire protection in this area, this project will replace and upgrade about 36,000 linear feet of aging distribution water main, um, defective water main valves and fire hydrants to reduce the water main breaks and service disruptions in the neighborhood. Shown on the slide is a typical plan of maintenance and protection of traffic. During construction, a minimum of two travel lanes will be maintained along the 7th Avenue and a minimum of one travel lane will be maintained in the side street. The sidewalks will remain accessible to pedestrians and businesses. At the lower right is a typical cross section of 7th Avenue. The work area may be on either side of the roadway, depending on where the existing water main is located. At least two travel lanes will be open to traffic and bike lanes and parking lanes will be maintained if they're not within the work area or needs to be used as temporary travel lanes. During the construction phase, the community will experience some impacts there will be railway lane closures and temporary loss of parkings as discussed in the previous slide. There will also be temporary relocation of bus stops, scheduled water main shutdowns, nighttime and weekend construction hours, and coordinations with open restaurants. DDC's community construction liaisons will be keeping the community informed. They will address concerns response to inquiries, attend meetings as needed, and distribute project-related materials to keep the community informed and notified. This project is a fiscal year 2024 project. 40% final design was completed in February of this year, followed by the alignment meeting with private utility companies in March. We anticipate completing the 75% final design by July of 2022, and the contract drawings will be distributed to community boards. Final design completion is anticipated to be December of 2022. The expected start of construction is fall of 2023, and the estimated construction duration is four years. Um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. So anyone has uh, committee members, do you have any questions? Okay, Tina. Hi there, um, just two questions. It sounds like from what you're saying is there won't be a disruption to any subway service, correct? Not at all. Not at all, okay. And then um, you said that there would be a disruption to the bus service. Um, I'm curious, when you do relocate the buses, are you also going to relocate if there's any uh, bus fare machine in that area? If there is one, you... yes. If, the, if there is one, yes, we are going to relocate it as well. Uh, typically, when we do this type of project, uh, what we are going to do is that we're going to kind of shut down a block per block. It's not the whole, the whole uh, 7th Avenue it will be one block at a time. So as, as uh, Zoe is presenting right now, 
if we are working on that on that block and if, if that block happens to have a bus path or bus stop then that's the only place that we are going to kind of move that bus bus stop to the next block temporarily until we finish with that block and then we bring back uh the service of the bus to that block oh, okay thank you uh dale hmm uh, that was pretty much my question was about the the M20 and the M7 buses, but that that effectively answers it. Okay, I have a few questions. So we just went through uh, ten years of uh, construction for Water Main on Ninth Avenue. So you are, we are very expert on everything that can go wrong. <laughs> and uh, the first question I have is on Seven Seven goes south, right? So where is going to be the opening? Is it going to be on the left, on the on the east side, or the? Most of the water main, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, soy, uh, but most of the water main is on the left side, going south. But also we have places in which the water main uh, goes on the right hand side. Okay, and where is the bike lane and the refuge? Where are they? It will be on the left side. Okay, so you are going to remove all the refuge. Well, well not remove. If, if the alignment of the water main happens to be under the refuge or median island, yes, in that case, we will remove them temporarily until we install the water main. And then when we finish, we are going to retrofit, bringing the median back to uh, its, uh, its original conditions. But the problem we have had on all your project is that when you bring it back, the DEP says, we don't want any trees and we don't want any plantings. No. Uh, so, what, so we have a, a major, deterioration of the, the context of the of, of the avenue after you have done your project for this project right and for every design project that ddc uh, does uh, before we go to the field we already know which tree is going to be damaged which tree is going to be kind of removed from the area and as far as i understand as of now we don't have any tree to be removed uh sorry am i correct yes that's correct so no trees, by trees, I mean the one which are on the island of the bike lane. We, we are, if we see that we have a tree uh, on top of the water main alignment, proposed water main alignment, we will change the water main alignment in order to save that tree. That is a wonderful, wonderful piece of news. So the water main alignment will, will avoid removing any of the, uh, of, of the trees. Of the tree, unless, unless it's, it's, it's uh, ultimately necessary to, to remove it, we will do it. And of course, this is in coordination with the Department of Parks, which we did already, but I'm not, we are not anticipating to remove any tree along 7th Avenue. Excellent. Uh, that's really, really good news. Um, the second thing is that, so you're going to do the side streets uh, what are the hours of operation? Right now, we, we have not uh, getting the, uh, the, the traffic stipulation given by uh, DOT or CMC, uh, but we are, we are thinking that uh, we are gonna get hours of working at uh, nighttime. No. You don't want nighttime? No. What time would you prefer to have this working? It's just the normal, uh, normal daytime hours. Because you know, this is uh, no, I don't. I, I that's what I'm asking you. Why, why do you prefer to have why? Because people need to sleep in the morning, the because people need to sleep. So you could have uh, you know, start at, at I don't know, eight o'clock or whatever and continue until maybe eight, but after that, people need to sleep. All right, so you 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 prefer this project to be built during the daytime, right? Okay, yes. we will apply, we will apply right. for both uh, hours and then. And then uh, the, so the Seventh Avenue bike lane, while you are doing the project, where is it going to go? We are going to relocate it temporarily again, since we are doing work uh, block by block, we are gonna relocate it to the other side. And then when we finish with that block, we will bring it to, to, that, uh, okay. to that area again. And you are confirming you are doing it block by block and not everything. By block by block, what I mean is that you're going to totally refinish a block before you move to the next, right? 
we will do a temporary restoration for the block that we had just completed it. And then the contractor will come back and do the whole reconstruction of the area. Okay, so the temporary restoration, we had that on 9th Avenue, it was a disaster. And that's what David was talking about. The, the bike lanes were horrible, the sidewalk were horrible. What we would like is you to do a final restoration block by block, because otherwise it goes on. We have like a huge, we have to wait for a very, very long time to get the neighborhood, or at least you can wait for having two blocks, you know, but don't wait to have all the blocks. We can't wait for that. Okay, we will uh, stipulate that in our, in our contract documents. Yeah, because it's, it was really, you know, what it is is that then everybody says, well, we are still in, in in works and it's it was very disruptive really yeah the, i understand that believe it or not not only i'm in, an engineer for the city i'm also a resident of the city yes <laughs> i know i know you are i don't live in jersey i live in queens right um and then um, side street okay and the other big problem we had on ninth avenue was the storage of material where is your storage going to be we don't know that at uh, the moment of the design. This is something that has to be uh, discussed between DDC construction when the project is there with you, the community board itself, to find out which is the best place for storage. We do not tell the contractor at this point where uh, uh, the storage area should be, but uh, this has to be coordinated during the construction between DDC construction, our community liaisons, and your, uh, your entities. So you're going to come back to us to ask where where the, where to put the, the storage? Yes, we always do. We well, I don't know. For everybody. You say we always do. I don't know whether we did that for Ninth Avenue. Oh. Uh, this well, is you big. have. Um, and uh, and so oh, also, DOT, also DOT has has a saying also on that because of the vehicular traffic. Right. So the okay. uh, DOT, uh, the community board contractor. Uh, you know, we'll coordinate to see which is the best location uh, okay. for storage. Okay. And uh, it's a lot of good news altogether. But, uh, and what are you doing about the, uh, the, the, the businesses along that? Well, like, like so explained, the sidewalks will be open at all times for, uh, for our pedestrians. That's not the question I have. When, when you are doing the work, you know, the businesses, you're going to be doing the work right in front of their buildings and they can't get deliveries or they can't get other things. So that's why, you know, it's, I think it would be good that you give us a schedule block by block. It will be, so that, it will be. Right now, right now, uh, as designers, we know uh, more or less what is our, our projection when we are going to complete the design of this project. But once this project is, is in the field, uh, DDC construction and again our community liaison together with the contractor they will create a schedule and the schedule will be uh, available uh, for viewing for uh, all the community and you see it here for instance they are talking about the community advisory the weekly look ahead bulletin in which they tell the community what's going to happen uh, next week couple of weeks ahead and is, the, is there going to be a major shutdown of the water main uh, this has to be informed also to the community Okay. Dale, do you have another question? Um, it's really just to drive home the point about daytime versus nighttime scheduling. Um, I think a lot of these projects work on the supposition that you want to mitigate traffic impacts as much as possible. And, you know, we recognize that. <clears throat> However, this in particular, our part of this project and CB4 is a heavily residential corridor. They so, are, what is a part of your project of, of the community, if, if I can ask? Sorry? Which section of the of 7th Avenue is your community board limits? Uh, so that would be um, 14th to 26th. Okay. And um, so we would like to favor, instead of uh, privileging the, the traffic conditions along 7th Avenue, we would like to privilege the residents' peace of mind for the duration of this project. Also, no, but no, wait a second. So you prefer also the, the the work to be done also during the daytime? Yeah. Yes, rather than overnight when it's very disruptive to people who are trying to sleep in their homes. Um, 
Also, it's our understanding that those nighttime contracts require like special con special pay rates that are much higher than daytime contracts. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, to, so what the city does is that we put the price out for bid. Mm -hmm. There's many different contractors that put the prices. So one price, one contractor can put a couple of million of dollars for this project, while other other contractor can put ten and twenty million dollars for this project. So, so that's something that we it. have no control on that. And what you just said, it doesn't really tell the story of of how uh, the prices come come uh, during bidding. Okay, but so okay. There's, not a, there's not a set pay scale for daytime versus nighttime. But I would exactly. assume that most contractors would put higher. Obviously, it is for the workers at, on a nighttime contract than on a daytime contract. At a premium time, over time, perhaps because yeah. of, yes, you are right. But that's not how we control this to the, the contractor. They will give us many different prices, and we are going to select uh, the lowest responsible bidder. Understood. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, David, Solnik. Yeah, I'm just going to be extremely repetitive. And I, I was going to repeat what both you and Dale just said about the hours. Right. And because uh, I think it's very important. And also what Christine said about um, not waiting for the entire project before doing the finishing, uh, you know, before before finishing. I mean, it was Ninth Avenue has been like Beirut after after the bombings um, and you know, for years and uh, for, bi for bicyclists. Um, and there's just no reason that, you know, I mean, I know the cars don't really care, but everybody else does. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to reiterate what Christine said about not, you know, maybe doing two blocks at a time, that's fine, but not waiting for the whole project to be finished before, before doing the finished paving. Yeah. Okay, so not it. Okay, so uh, I don't see anyone uh, raising their hands out there. Am I missing anyone? I uh, see. Yeah, in the attendees, there's Judith and Charlie. I'm going to bring them over. How come I don't see them? Oh, they are in the attendees section. Okay. Yeah, attendees list. Yeah. Right. Charlie? Hey, sorry, I was being brought over. Um, I just wanted to comment that, and this is in CB5's jurisdiction, I suppose, but there is no bike lane on 7th Avenue until you get to, I believe, 30th Street. Um, so I'm just imagining cycling down 7th, which is already very difficult because there's no bike lane um, south of 42nd until you get to 30th, and there being all this construction uh, additionally. So it seems like it would be a nice opportunity for a temporary bike lane to be built there where currently there is none. Mm -hmm. So that would be from, in this project, that would be from uh, 34 to 26, right? I think the new lane starts at 30th, if, I'm, if I recall yeah, correctly. That's something that I cannot speak about because uh, that's up to uh, CDDOT. Yeah. Uh, I don't have, I'm not at that pay level to determine what needs to be done in the city in terms of. But okay. you can talk to DOT. We can also tell them that this comment was made during this presentation. But again, uh, I, I cannot say, yes, it will be done. No, it will not be done. Uh, all I can do is, is pass this information to DOT and see. Yeah, we, un we, we understand. Uh, we understand. And where is uh, Judith? Is Judith coming over? Um, let me try again. Judith, you need to accept to be brought over. Oh. Well, until she is. Judith, are you with us? Do you have a question about this topic? If you do, you can unmute now. She's not over here. No, she, she, I don't think she's there. Where's Judith? Oh, I can see Judith. Judith, can you can you unmute yourself?
um, until then, where is um, uh, David? David Warren, you had a question. Um, yes, one I wanted to really reiterate uh, about the time of the construction, which is great. I agree with Christine, Dale, and David. Also, I want to emphasize and strongly support what Charles Todd said about the bike, putting temporary bollards for the bike lane. That would be a wonderful cherry on the cake. That would okay. make all the difference. That's what I would say. Um, so Janine, we can't get Judith on the, on the, um, no, she's not responding. Okay. So we're going to wrap this one up. Um, so I'll summarize what I'm hearing for the first project. We were talking about having the, the, the end of the project going from Monday seven to, to four in the afternoon. And then for the rest. Uh, of the project, we have asked that uh, we uh, understand that there will be no tree removal, no uh, uh, on the pedestrian refuge. That we we are asking that they complete the blocks, one or two blocks completely before moving to the next one. That they do uh, the work during the day, and um, that. I think I have, we, we would like to know where the storage is going to be and um, essentially right. ask for a temporary bike lane from 34 to 26. That's what everything I heard. Uh, can someone make a motion? Motion to adopt. Okay, we have a second. Second. Okay, anybody oppose? Present non eligible. Okay. Next subject, thank you so much, the DDC team. That was uh, a lot of good news and a lot of flexibility. And we are very happy that you came so early so we can give you our comments. And- uh, thank you very much, we appreciate your time. And we'll, come to, we'll talk to DOT about those things as well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you guys, bye-bye. Um, the second item is uh, a subject which was raised at the last board meetings, a reduction in transportation emissions. And we are lucky enough to have Jason Zimbler from NYS ERDA. And Jason is going to tell us what these initials mean. And <laughs> we are very pleased to have you uh, uh, at the meeting to tell us what your organization is and what you are doing to reduce the emissions. Sure, thank you for, uh, for having us. New York uh, has a state energy office and that is um, effectively what we are. We are the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. And we are uh, the agency that uh, is tasked with effectuating New York's climate goals. <clears throat> we are a um, public benefit corporation, but also quasi-governmental. Um, we are funded by largely by ratepayer funds and uh, by some other uh, climate revenue instruments such as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And those um, funds provide uh, us with the necessary funding for programming, which is all in service of, mostly in service of uh, reducing greenhouse gases and other uh, criteria pollutants. So that's the broad strokes of what NYSERDA does. I am on the transportation team and um, we have a very broad remit, which is to uh, comply with the state's uh, now uh, law of decarbonizing the entire economy by 2050. And in the transportation sector, that is a, a really big lift. It's, transportation corresponds to about a third of the state's emissions. So uh, we have a number of policies and a number of programs that we run. And um, we also, have a bit more of a focus on uh, areas outside of New York City because New York City also has uh, climate efforts and, and climate programming. Um, so we coordinate where we can. We don't do as much directly in the city because of the city's efforts. But I can speak about what we're doing um, on electric vehicles because that is my portfolio and electric vehicle charging. And I can, well, I'll stop there um, having touched on what we do 
and uh, if there are any questions, and then I can get into what um, I specifically work on. Do you know? I mean, I guess my uh, big question is, when are we gonna get more charging stations for people? And I don't know if this is the right time to ask it or to listen to the end, but there's a bit of a frustration out. There's a lot of frustration out there for those who want a car, but don't want a car that uses uh, anything, any pollutants. So how soon could we see that? Where can we see it? How many can we see? And how soon can we see it? Well, that's you know, one I, question. I think that's the subject of the whole presentation, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Sorry. So, before, so before you get so before you get into that, I had one or two questions myself. So are you involved into um, the first part of the objective, the goals, which is to really how to achieve the goals is to first reduce uh, the number of miles traveled. So people switch to new modes. And then my understanding is that the second part is to also, uh, you know, electrify or whatever the, the modes which are, which are, you know, which continue to be um, vehicular, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and, and that is um, a key pillar of the of the strategy is to um, try to achieve system efficiency and and uh, transportation demand management to shift mode of travel to shift time of travel to use the system more efficiently to the extent possible to uh, reduce single occupancy vehicle vehicle VMT vehicle miles traveled and and try to encourage the use of shared modes or micro mobility things like bikes and scooters or walking, um, things that are, are much lower emissions profile. And then of course, you know, with the remaining uh, trips that need to be made and the vehicles that exist uh, to, to pursue zero emission strategies, whether that's with um, initially with hybrids or ideally with full battery electrics or fuel cell electrics as the case may be. Okay. And, and, and is your focus on vehicles, are you focusing on the, on the fleets, on buses, trucks? I focus on uh, my- Sanitation. My focus is on all of these things. Um, my, I'm a project manager in the group, and so I have a particular sub-focus on okay. charging infrastructure and deploying charging infrastructure across the state and developing programs to encourage the um, construction and development of charging stations. Um, so my focus over the uh, last few years has been predominantly in DC fast charging. And um, I, I, would it be helpful to, to um, illustrate the um, differences between charging levels or people familiar sure. with? Sure, go ahead. Take it yeah. over. <laughs> so, um, you know, vehicles can charge at, at a number, at a variety of, of rates of, um, electricity flow and uh, you could plug them into a, a standard wall outlet at 110 volt and 10 amp and it would take you know 40 or 50 hours to fill a car with a large battery. Um, but what is commonly used because cars dwell for a long period of time is level two charging and that's 240 volt set 30, 30 or 40 or more amps and that can charge a car easily in a few hours or overnight if it's you know empty to full. And that is really well suited to um, people's uh, travel make travel making and trip patterns. The people dwell at a grocery store for a period of time, or overnight, or um, on a curbside. And so, there's a, a proliferating level two is a really important strategy to getting cars, um, uh, keeping cars full, and allowing them to do a lot of their miles on electricity. But um, not not everybody has a dedicated parking spot, and not everybody has a chance to get back to a level two plug every night. So there are fast charging plugs that are 500 volts or a thousand volts and hundreds and hundreds of amps and can charge vehicles in as little as maybe 20 minutes and as much as 40 minutes given current technology, maybe an hour. Um, but that's more in line with, you know, a rest stop at a, on a trip on a highway and stopping for a bathroom and lunch or what, what have you. And so it's a mix of strategies, it really a, a charging strategy that is comprehensive includes both level two, a lot of level two and, and some fast charging to, to address 
um, longer trips and those without dedicated charging. Um, we have done extensive estimations and infrastructure projections, assessments of what the need of infrastructure is to serve the growing EV fleet. We estimate that there's going to be, right now we just crossed 100,000 EVs in New York State as of maybe the last two or three months. It's a nice milestone, but barely a dent in the 10 million vehicle fleet of New York State. And uh, of all of all vehicles on the road, of all classes and, and duty cycles. Um, and we have a commitment or we we share in a, uh, a commitment with California to have um, uh, a large sum of vehicles on the road by 2025. The New York portion of it is about 850,000 vehicles. So in the next three years, um, with aggressive growth, we could get there, but we have to get from 100,000 to meet our targets, 100,000 vehicles electric now to 800,000 800 or so in, in 2025. We, we have used that number, that target of vehicles to back into some number of targets of, uh, of charging stations that are necessary to serve that demand of that number of state of that number of vehicles. The, no, and, and so this is a mix of fast chargers and level two chargers, and it's a mix of chargers in different locations that could be, um, so I, I'm, I'll focus on, on non-residential because that's really what I think about. Uh, residential char chargers are, you know, people's garages or people's, um, you know, homes are are a key another key element of it. But we don't have it. We we don't focus our program design on that. People are going to install chargers when and when when it's right for them. If they buy an EV in their homes if they have the ability to do it. Um, fo we focus on public charging because that's what needs more public attention and public subsidy. We think that the number is in the neighborhood of 50,000 level two plugs um, to meet the, the vehicle target of 850,000 um, EVs. And that would be a mix of workplace chargers that, aren't, that wouldn't necessarily show up as a public charger, but are very key because people drive to work and the car sits there for this eight hours or so that they're at work and they can fill up. That could be a really good strategy for somebody who doesn't have home charging, but goes to work every day and can choose to switch to an electric vehicle because they have a dedicated plug point. So workplace chargers are important. Public chargers, those on, on the curbside, those at um, supermarkets, those <laughs> malls, movie theaters, the uh, libraries, the places where people go and, and stay for more than an hour or, or half an hour even. And then, um, and then the number of so about 50,000 uh, level two plugs divided between workplace and public and then another three or 4,000 DC fast chargers in New York state. Um, this is, I'm talking about statewide numbers right now. So there is, it's not uniformly distributed. It's certainly, it corresponds to the, to the um, clustering of vehicles and to the, the distribution of the vehicles in the state. So certainly more of the, more chargers will happen downstate. Um, <clears throat> now, New York city, I'm not as familiar with this, so I won't speak um, beyond my awareness, but New York City has its own goals for charging stations in um, just within the city's borders. And I believe that I believe that's 10,000 plugs, 10,000 level two plugs. Um, I see I see a nod, so I, I think that's that could be right. Um, and I, but I don't know their timeline. It could be the same 2025 goal. Um, and, and by the way, that these are these are just interim targets. We we have to get to full vehicle electrification uh, by by 2040, 2050. So you know we'll need orders of magnitude more than what we need just by 2025. But this is the the sites that we've set now, and the and the programs that we are designing and the funding to get charging stations built are in are in service of of meeting these goals. So I'll pause there. Um. Dale. Mm. Okay. Um, thank you for the um, overview. Yes. So it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong or put some nuance into my blanket statement that if if a if a charging if an if an electric vehicle is charged on power that is produced through uh, emissions based. Uh, um, mean, non yeah, non-renewable, then we're not at a net, we're not at a, we're not at a net benefit. 
Is there more? No, that is that's that's okay. my understanding. Uh, you're you're ahead. You're ahead in a number of ways, even if it was entirely coal produced electricity. Number one, the efficiency of a of a vehicle of an electric vehicle far far exceeds the efficiency of a combustion engine. A combustion engine converts about twenty percent of the energy in the gasoline to motion, motion whereas uh, so you're wasting the rest. It's going to heat and emissions. And you're using about, uh, for the energy and electricity, you're using about 80% of it for, for motion. So you're, you're using fewer units of energy. You're, you're needing less energy as, a, as an original input to produce the motion. So that's a huge first step. The second step is that um, the electricity is going to be produced at the, at the source, at the generation source. And there are, um, EPA controls that, there are emissions associated with that with that generation. But when you come down to the vehicle, it is emissions free at the, at the, tra at the area of travel. And so there are byproducts of, um, of combusting gasoline that are not just greenhouse gas, they're air quality uh, pollutants. And none of those exist um, around the places that people travel. So air quality, uh, so there's more generation necessary to produce the fuel, the electricity that would have otherwise not needed to go into an electric vehicle, but there are controls on the power plant. And also New York has a plan to be fully emissions free in its generation stock by 2040. Um, so that that elect source electricity is getting cleaner. Um, it's already some of the cleanest electricity in the state. Uh, but the fact that you're avoiding local air, you're improving local air by not uh, having some of the byproducts of combustion um, as the vehicles are moving around is a huge gain. Got it. Thank you for putting some some significant nuance on that. And also, um, where are we at in terms of uh, energy generation in this? Do, can you do you have that statistic? Like currently, where are we at in terms of energy generation in the state? Uh, combustion versus renewable? Is it like two thirds, one third? Uh, that's, you know, I don't, I'm, I haven't looked that up recently. Um, we have a goal of 70% uh, renewable by 2030 and 100% renewable, this is power production by 2040. Um, the numbers right now are probably what you say about two thirds fossil, uh, but it, it very, it, it's actually very different between the downstate grid and the upstate grid. The upstate, mm. upstate grid is very heavily um, sourced by hydro, and the downstate grid doesn't have a lot of hydro. It's, it, it was a lot of Indian point electricity, nuclear electricity, that's now offline. There's a lot of fossil uh, electricity downstate, and especially peaker plants, um, but that is um, in the process of changing because we have uh, nine gigawatts of offshore wind in the process of being either procured or in early stages of development and construction. So the wind farms off of Long Island are gonna feed the downstate grid and NYSERDA and other state partners just negotiated or awarded some very large bids to some develop to developers who are gonna bring down some new transmission lines from Quebec where more hydro from Quebec is gonna get fed into the downstate grid. So that allows us to turn off more fossil generation downstate. So. Um, really positive movement in this area to clean up the generation. Okay, so assuming we're on goal for the for the energy generation, the 2030 and the 2040 goals, it'll be increasingly cleaner and cleaner sources. Yeah, every mile you drive over time gets cleaner because the generation's getting cleaner, yeah. Until it's 100% renewable and then it's, it's just as clean as it's gonna be. Great, thank you so much. Yep. So I, I have two questions, one which is a precursor to the other one. You said 800, we need 850,000 vehicles. How did this number come about? Uh, so California uh, had air quality issues that preceded the development of the um, EPA and the Clean Air Act in the 1960s. And as a result of some of their earlier moves to regulate um, pollution in, um, in their state, which was you know, dramatically bad in the 50s and 60s, when at, the develop, at the time of the writing of the Clean Air Act and um, the development of the EPA, there was a carve out given to California to set regulations, pollution regulations that exceeded the federal government's regulations. 
And in addition to their power to set a higher standard state, they also had the ability to allow states, peer states to sign on to their higher regulations. And not on a not on a blanket basis, but on a case by case basis. So New York and 10 or between 10 and 15 other states in um, in the country have joined California in one aspect of air their air regulations, which is to commit to um, having uh, reducing their NOx, the nitrogen oxides, and their uh, some of their other criteria pollutants, and associated with those targets and those uh, regulations are commitments or they've, they've sort of created a, a vehicle number, a target vehicle number that is, is associated with achieving those lower, those improved air quality thresholds. And so I, I think this, uh, the whole coalition, it's called the multi-state ZEV coalition that came into being and joined with California. I think the whole coalition is supposed to have 5 million vehicles by 2025 and New York's portion of that is 850,000. And and so that's fascinating but it, and so my question was what portion of the current number of vehicles we have in New York state does 850 represent is it 10% is it 20% We have 10 million we have 10 million vehicles in New York. 10 million so it's so 10%. It would be 10%. It will be 8 to 10%. Okay. Um and um and to go back to what the question that Tina was asking, I went on your calculator, a uh, uh, locator of uh, chargers, and I saw, I was surprised to see that in CB4, we have 119 plugs. Yeah, it's and, very common that um, uh, garages will right. install chargers. Right, and then the, in Manhattan, we have 948, which, so I hear a lot of people saying we don't have any, but at the same time, we have a gas station, 31 gas station in Manhattan. And what, you, you don't have a lot of publicly accessible level two charging. You have a lot of garage. Well, they are, we're all listed as a publicly accessible. Yeah, but you're going to have to pay a garage fee. Um, okay. And that's and then, something that needs to change. Yeah, and so that's, that's my next question. It's like, um, <laughs> so... So you can do it, but you have to pay a garage, which isn't normal, right? You should park your car in the garage. Price parking, parking should have a fair price. There, there. It is a right. it is scarce resource. The the right of way and garage space. It should be priced. But right. right. But the fact that somebody needs a charge shouldn't require them necessarily pay for two hours at a garage if that's not what they intended to do. So the city has to, is, is in the process of addressing this and their 10,000 plug number is all on the curb. Right, and, and I, I, we are going to have a discussion about that in one second, which we have a major, I have a major objection to that. This now, is like using public space to do what other people were doing in the private space, which was a gas station. So I don't think this is a right, you know, you are, but let me go back to my to the point before. Shouldn't it be the the, the, the the highest you know focus of everyone is to take those level two station and turn them into level three, so people don't have to pay for five or three or five hours of parking. Because if you had a, an incentive going on I, I for would... all of those level two to become level three then we wouldn't have a problem, right? No, it does not change the situation um, because cars are, so, so what I would, this, this is a, a nuanced point you're making and, and we could spend a lot of time on this, but the, the, this, the better solution would be to work with the garage industry to come up with a way for, and there's gaming that's gonna happen here, but the, a solution would be there are chargers, they, should be better used and there shouldn't be a paywall necessarily. So there should be a way, to, and, and some of the uh, colleagues the government have, have been working on some of this by setting some restrictions for funding that the garages shouldn't necessarily require an hourly charge on top of the, the fair price of the electricity. You should have to pay a payment. On Paul Could everybody uh, put their, themselves on kind of deeply unlikable and deeply offensive to as a, an assistant. She does it originally. She does some kind of- Who is that? 
That's it? What was yeah, that? I think we're good. Okay. Um, by, by opening up those stations to people who are gonna pay for the electricity just as they would for the gas, but not for, for having to pay for the parking is a big way to move that forward so that there's no, those spaces can no longer be used as to, to earn revenue for, for parking hours, but they open up as, as charging resources and maybe there needs to be some additional you know, fee right. to the garage for, for that service. But that is that is a way to to open up plugs. Now the challenge with what you're talking about is um, that the uh, these level the level three plugs and the fast charge plugs are between ten and twenty times more expensive than the level twos. Right. And, and the capital cost is one barrier, and the additional electricity service is uh, significant. The interconnection costs and the additional service are another barrier, another significant barrier. So the I wouldn't say that, um, and I we've worked with researchers to look at where fast charging needs to be, especially in the context of how we electrify ride hail fleets and taxi fleets and understand where they are gonna get their charging. It's not necessarily in Manhattan and and in and in which actually parallels the the gas station situation. The it's more likely that they're gonna be in the inner ring of the outer boroughs where land is a little cheaper, where people are gonna dwell more, where it's gonna be less costly to upgrade um, significant, to have significant upgrades in the electricity uh, distribution system. But I would, I would argue that, I think I agree with you. I, I would argue though that the situation in Manhattan of having essentially a gas station on the sidewalk is not uh, desirable because a number of things, because they are pedestrian, because it's using a public space. And I don't know why we should be using public space for uh, essentially an activity, which is a private activity, which is to drive a car. And second, once you have installed those- It doesn't, it doesn't, one, you mean- Let, let, me, let, let me finish, let me finish. I'm not, not done yet. Uh, and, once you have installed those stations, those charger, if people want to come and install a bike lane or a bus lane, there is going to be tremendous pushback on that. So that's where you have a tremendous friction with the other objective, which is the larger objective of getting people out of their cars. And, and I think that, you know, putting the chargers on this, I mean, I think there should be a tremendous amount of incentives given to the garage and uh, funding, et cetera, to convert to number three, you know, uh, to charging number three, so that they are equipped to, to give what needs to be, to, to give what needs to be done. And so that it doesn't go in a place. And uh, because anyway, that's, that's my, uh, the, the, the thing we are very concerned is like, you know, what's going to happen when you go to a precinct with all an NYPD and they have 70 cars there and they all want to have their charger. What are we going to do? I mean, that this is, we have concentration of people in the wrong place, which are taking space away from, you know, bike lane, bus lane, pedestrians. And by funding those chargers on the sidewalk in Manhattan, I agree that maybe outside of Manhattan, that's not an issue. You have wide sidewalk, it's wonderful. But I think, I think there is a real issue. So, okay. uh, Viren. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly clarify, um, Christine. Um, the curbside charging stations do not take up that much room. They, in fact, smaller than Link and YC kiosk. Which are so terrible. Uh, Which are terrible. Those, those are terrible. But the sort of charging stations are much smaller in footprint. That's true, about, but but you know why would you put something on the public space uh, the, that no, that is today a private transaction? I mean, that it becomes a kind of, yeah, no, Christine. That becomes a kind of negotiation in a way, right? What is the benefit if we are willing to give away the parking lane for private businesses like restaurants to, to benefit from it? Maybe there's a way or mechanism that you could think about where people who are charging their cars by the curbside actually end up paying a partial fee for it, or something of that nature. So that becomes a kind of mechanism as to how you negotiate a kind of larger public benefit. 
But in terms of actually occupying too much space, they are much smaller. No, but if you want to put a bike lane there, you're not going to be able to do that. No, but this will be on the sidewalk, not off the sidewalk. It doesn't well, once you have the thing on the sidewalk, you cannot charge a car, which is outside of the bike lane. So that right. doesn't work anymore. No, but what I'm saying is that there is a conflict between those two, those two concepts. Bike lane would be a conflict, but why would you want to put charging station by the bike lane? Just well, you don't know whether you're going to need a bike lane tomorrow. And yeah. the, the, the way we plan our bus stops, we don't put them by the uh, bike lanes precisely for the same reasons. So it becomes a kind of coordination and planning issue and design issue. It's not unachievable. No, I just I just think that you had a uh, you know if you had a car you had to park the car and be, have, having the car on the lane is is not a good model. I mean we have said that over and over again, and so locking those cars with the charging here is not necessarily a good mo model. But that's no, my no no look, I agree I, I agree but I think it's a planning problem. It's a planning and design problem much more than you and I kind of deciding what's right and what is wrong. So in other words, it's a much larger sort of coordination issue in terms of planning for uh, new infrastructure for the city. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. that's what I, I'm saying. Okay. David. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I kind of wanted to reiterate the current gas station model, uh, you know, in parking garages, the, you know, the gas station makes, most of the money goes to Shell or to, Exxon, of course, but the gas station makes some money too um, for accommodating, for having the private property and accommodating, you know, all the, all the things that are needed for a gas station. So um, I don't see any reason why the parking garage wouldn't be the same arrangement. It would be cheaper because the amount of space you need for a charging station is obviously far less than the amount of space you need for gas tanks and, you know, all of the infrastructure that goes along with gasoline. But um, uh, I, I just don't see any reason why the parking garages could, shouldn't make some amount of money. Some percentage of, of the cost would go to the, to the garage and that would incentivize them to, to have them. And, and that's where we want cars parked. That's, that's where we want to encourage cars to be parked. So it seems like a no brainer. I mean, the gas station in this case is, is the best model uh, for, for electricity. You're just a different fuel. Mm. Understood, but the gas station model as it currently exists, if you know, we turn the calendar back before EVs, the equilibrium that the market found was that very few gas stations were going to be in, in New York and people would fuel up elsewhere, park their car, trust that they had enough you know, fuel stored to be able to get to the next gas station. There weren't many. And I believe that that basic behavioral, uh, those, those frameworks, the way that um, land should be used, the, the economics of, of gas stations, the way that people fuel, you know, EVs are coming up to the same, uh, coming up in, in, in competition in terms of range. They're obviously still more costly, but they have a number of models now have more than 300 miles, which you know, it starts to get close to what a, what a gasoline car does. So if you had, you know, you, you charged your car, you, you parked it on your block, you wouldn't need a gas station nearby. You would need it the next time you took a trip or something like that. So I think there's not necessarily a, um, an immediate need to shift the notion of, um, of where these fast charging hubs need to be. You know, I think that can be pretty similar to gas stations because of the extraordinary cost associated with it. Um, and, and the lower cost, the actual, the lower cost option to get, you know, a proliferation of charging everywhere is to, is to build a lot of level two everywhere cars stop and, and dwell for a period of time. And that's garages. I think that's curb. I, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic or sensitive to the notion that you can have a protected bike lane if you have a charging station on the curb, because that cord would then be going to the car. I recognize that. Um, but you know, there's not every street is going to have one necessarily. And some of the bike lanes are going to be on the other side of the cars. And so you have a lot of curb space that you have available to serve a lot of the public right of way, which is the street side that we're giving away, you know, to cars, to private cars, um, much of that unpriced. Um, so we can serve, and if we're trying to get to a vehicle transition, a 100% electric vehicle transition, every vehicle is going to need a charge 
and every vehicle is going to be electric and is going to dwell on the curb. And if it has a chance to plug in when it's when it's there, that means there are fewer charging. You know, there's less range anxiety. It's a lower cost to the to the system, to the society as a whole, to get all that charging built. There's some strong um, reasons to to figure out how the grid impact can be managed against some of the other social needs. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think you know a big part of the problem is you know it's assumed that cars should be allowed to park on private on public property, and and the charging stations are going you know if if they're out there are going to cement that um that assumption um and I, I think you know part of this is about challenging the assumption that the public right-of-way should be dedicated to private car storage i agree um, and and uh you know by putting charging stations there you're but you're solidifying you're solidifying that you can actually monetize those stations that that part that public right of way better than, than you could have before because the city can take a piece of the charging and the city can use that money to maintain upkeep of the street in a better way some of them obviously the money is going to have to go to the unit cost of electricity but there are other costs of, associated with it so there's actually a way to have a better transaction a better interaction maybe between government and public in that scenario well that yeah i mean that might help the money flow but it's not just about money it's about using public property to store private private uh, possessions, <laughs> you know, meaning a car, and it, 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 yeah, the money is part of it, but it's not all of it. It's 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 uh, you know, cars streets were originally designed for motion, not for storage, right. and 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 you're incentivizing more storage of a, of private property. I don't think that this would could be. I would disagree respectfully. I don't think we are incentivizing more storage. I think all the storage has already been allocated and we've made the decision as a society to allow a lot of free storage of vehicles. What we're trying to do now is improve emissions and convert all of those vehicles to electric and to do that in a, in a low cost way to the system. And so does it lock in some, uh, some storage? It doesn't change the storage situation, but we could also say that none, no curbside charging should be built. It should only be fast chargers in, you know, um, Greenpoint and uh, LIC, and then uh, and we could do away with uh, storage and pub private parking on on the public right away. I I I don't I'm not advocating for that, but society could make that decision if it chooses. But I but I don't think these incentives necessarily change the nature of the storage question, and and hopefully. You know, everybody's air quality improving is a, is one of the main takeaways here. Mm. Tuna. Okay, don't be a messenger here, but um, in the perfect world, everybody would walk and take public transportation, and I'm a total advocate of that. Um, but the problem is, is there are people who will not. Um, I mean, in truth, they won't take tra public transportation. And with that reality, I would rather do anything possible to decrease the carbon footprint with the reality that a certain population, and it might not be large, but a certain population will opt to get the electric charging car to help a little bit um over um you know the gas guzzling car um but my concern is is that knowing the price of garages in our district they might not pay for what can be a hundred dollars for just parking for eight hours again i totally agree if everybody in this district would get rid of their cars. Yeah, that's the perfect world, but I don't think we have the perfect world. And that's why I personally would like to see some solution that took in consideration that people will opt for these electric or hybrid cars. Um, oh, I think we all agree that having electric cars is very good, right? So I don't know, I don't know that anybody disagree with that. 
oh, and yeah. that we want to reduce the emission. I think the question is, you know, how you do it. Right. More, more is, than anything. And as, what you are saying is that the garage is way too expensive because it's four hours. And, you know, I, if I were in charge, I would say, okay, let's put all the money to get those garage to be equipped for level three. Like we had the presentation about the gravity company, which is going to do level three. And that seemed to be the perfect intelligent way to do it and say, look, you have a car, you go in the garage, you give it to them. One hour later, bingo, your car is ready. You have not paid a, an arm and a leg for that. I think, I think to me, this is, this is a good model, you know. That would be great if it would work. I know in our building, there are all these cars and there are electrical charging stations near us, but no one has access to them other than companies or people who are affiliated with that. And that's a sort of thing that needs to be right. changed, that it's more available to the public. My, my question, though, is, is there a New York City office that deals with this planning or is it just statewide? No, the mayor's office of sustainability right. um, in the previous administration was, and I'm not as familiar with the personnel now after the after the changeover, but um, that was the office that was leading the planning charge and working with uh, city DOT on um, establishing the plans, the targets, mm -hmm. the, the locations, the the needs assessments. So between city DOT and and uh, MOS. Uh, that those would be the two agencies I'd, I'd point you to. Thanks. Uh, Vera, and you're back. Yes, just very quick, quick one. Jason, you're right. I think uh, Mayor's Office um, of Sustainability and DOT in conjunction are working on the plans to kind of do the planning for where this uh, charging station would go. Going back to David's point and the point that you just made a few minutes ago, Jason, about we already have dedicated parking lanes. We already have more than half a day of free parking available to folks. We also have parking meters. So this infrastructure can be pretty well integrated into that existing infrastructure with a difference. And the caveat is that you monetize. You, you know, just the way you will be parking for X number of hours and paying parking amount, you will actually continue to do so even while charging your car. So there are ways and means of achieving the goal of reducing the carbon emissions improving the quality of air and life, at the same time, making car drivers that, that come into the city pay for it. So there could be a city surcharge. So if you charge your car uh, outside of the CBD or sort of uh, dense areas, uh, you have a lesser amount to pay. When you come to Manhattan, you want to charge, you have a slight city surcharge that you end up paying. So there are ways in which you can, this car can be scanned. And I think, um, it's all about planning, and I think it's, it, it is achievable. And with the technology sort of improving rapidly, even the bus stops, for example, can become the charging stations for city MTA buses, for example. Parking spots and parking meters can also become that sort of places where you could actually avail charging. So there are ways, I mean, I, 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 we don't need to sit here and design these, these ideas, but there's enough sort of knowledge out there with which we can actually have very transformed infrastructure of the city. David. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think in, in, the, in the answer to my, my comment, there was the assumption that all parking garages would have level three charging. And I don't see why that would be true. Um, it seems to me they, that, that many people park over, overnight in Manhattan and, uh, you know, have in, in their garage and that they would, that those could easily be level two mm -hmm. it might mm -hmm. even be a different price for level they might have both they might have level two and level three and there'd be different prices for the two because one costs more than the other um and that uh and that people coming into manhattan who don't live in manhattan are, are it seems to me they're more likely to charge outside of manhattan anyway um so i mean you might be yeah. you might be trying to solve a problem that we don't need to have um which is to get everybody charged here in Manhattan in our, you know, there's no reason to, to try and accommodate everyone who, with a car in, C, in CD4 um, because a lot of those people are coming in temporarily and, can, and will more likely charge where they come from. 
and it, and if they do park their car here, they can they can park in a level two. They they can use a level two uh, level two in a garage. Yes, I think you're right, and and some garages will choose to do that. Market forces will dictate that. You know, the opportunity to have a, a capture more revenue from um, fast charging. Um, some will some will opt to do that. I, we just have to be uh, very mindful about the the incentives for adding um, uh, for increasing VMT in the dense area. And, and having a lot of level three um, and that would people would seek out would, would add trips um, where in areas that are congested and may not be able to support additional VMT. So, uh, I, I, you know, you had the presentation from Gravity, that, that's a good example of, that's a midtown charger they're trying to build, a hub in, on 9th Avenue and 42nd, between 9th and 10th, I think. And, um, and that's going to be serve. That's going to serve a lot of ride hail vehicles. I think Gravity wants to run a, a ride hail fleet, um, the same way Revel has has started to do. Um, but it's also going to have a dual use with uh, with the public. And and so I think there will be isolated examples where that's going to work, and it's going to work really well. Um, and you're right. I don't think everybody who parks overnight needs to have charging. But if you're thinking about how to get a lot of how to how to get all of these vehicles electrified and all of these miles uh, served on electric mobility, you have to think about the um, uh, uh, total system cost, and especially as you're designing an incentive and you look at um, the ways in which you can serve the needs of the charging need in various implementations and various deployment strategies. And so, we know that uh, a, a wider um, uh, wider availability of level two is uh, is beneficial and with with a little modest amount of, of fast charging um, and and that's been proven through a number of research studies national labs have have looked at this extensively and and we follow some of those best practices so uh, you know bottom line it's get, there is going to be level three in, in in Manhattan in the urban core um, it, there should be some there are gas stations. Um, there should be a fair amount of level two. It's good in, in garages because it's not an impact, doesn't impact the right of way, but adding some in the right of way is a good thing too um, because people have, this is where the people expect to park and people, if they don't have a dedicated parking spot, they are re reluctant to, to go electric in the first place. And so if you can provide more uh, charging points, people have more confidence to, um... now I'll say one other thing. Um, Conductive, uh, you know, plugging a vehicle in with with a wire is not the only strategy. There are there's technology development happening in the inductive space, you know, where where wireless charging happens, and so you can put wireless charging pads um, underneath parking spots, and that wouldn't present cords going between the cable and the and the and the vehicle, and you could have that on the, you know, separated with a protected bike lane on the curb, and then the vehicles with inductive wireless pads underneath. So there's other um, technology maturation that's still happening. And so there's, the, you know, there are a number of ways that this could go. Okay, David, thank you. Yes, David, I um, wanted to, first of all, I, I agree with Christine about the parking. Maybe this is out of your lane and you won't be able to answer this, but my concern is, um, is the congestion that these electric vehicles will have. I mean, it's going to be the same as regular gasoline so it's, we, have, we have a terrible problem in our community with congestion. If, if that's in your lane or you've done some studying, what's your take on that? Because just because the vehicle's electric, it's not going to reduce congestion. Um, you know, just as a thought exercise, you could just imagine that all vehicles were on were electric. You know, if you wave a wand, they'd all be electric. They wouldn't. They wouldn't necessarily. It wouldn't change the necess the, the nature of trip making. Um, if all if electric vehicles had a 300 mile battery or range, you know they can, they don't need special extra trips for charging. They don't behave differently than than combustion vehicles. So I don't know that uh, the electrification uh, endeavor has a big impact on on congestion, on the difference in trip making, and in that you know early 
technology, uh, early versions of EVs have very short range. They probably have to make more trips, but now the ones that are coming to market are, you know, 300 miles and more. So ultimately, I don't, I don't think that, that it's, it vastly, I don't think that there's a big impact to congestion. More or less. Okay. Uh, somebody in the attendees, Eric, Eric, what, do you have a comment? Janine, can you bring Eric over? Yeah, I'm coming here for Charlie. Oh, and Charlie has a comment too. And, and bring Charlie. Hi, well. Thank you. It takes takes a couple of spots and presses, unfortunately. Um, I, I, Jason, I appreciate all of the um, the background on, on what seems like a um, a slow growth of, of electric vehicles up to a, a couple percent of the total at, at present. Um, I, I want to just kind of zoom out a little bit, make sure that we're not um, uh, moving um, deck chairs around on the Titanic here. Um, I, I, I see that you know cars are continuing to grow in size. I see that our, our governor has decided to subsidize fossil fuels by creating a gas tax holiday. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense, what is the, um, the recent trends in the amount of uh, gasoline um, and other fossil fuels consumed by vehicles in New York in the past few years? How, how has that been doing? Uh, uh, there are fuel reports that are published by New York State's statistical agencies, as well as EPA that, that report on, on bulk fuel purchases. We could, I could you know, look that up. I'm not sure off the top of my head. We could chart exactly the amount of, you know, pretty with pretty close precision, the number of gallons are sold, consumed in New York. I believe it's probably flat. Um, you know, there are 100,000 vehicles. It's not a big dent in the, as you said, in the total vehicle population. But um, as that grows, there will be a meaningful reduction in, uh, uh, it's, it's not just the transition to EVs, but it's also the, um, cafe standards that are increasing. So combustion vehicles are having each, each year, the automakers are having to adhere to a higher uh, efficiency and better miles per gallon on their combustion vehicles. So there's a reduction in, um, or a flatlining, even amongst vehicle growth or population growth, you know, with increased efficient vehicle efficiency, there could be flat or declining and fuel sales. And this is something that's actually a, a real challenge for the for the federal highway administration. The the gas tax, the federal gas tax, funds the highway construction and maintenance, and the efficiency in in vehicle uh, inc efficiency increases in vehicles over the last twenty years has eaten into um, the revenues to the federal highway administration. They haven't raised the tax, and vehicles have gotten more efficient. They're going to get much more efficient. There are new targets that um, the EPA just announced on the automakers and they're gonna push the combustion cars to, to a higher standard. Now New York has, we're now have a, a law that uh, all sales of light duty vehicles in New York have to be electric by 2035. And there's a ramp, you know, it's not a light switch. So by 2026, it starts the ramp. So every year it's gonna increase. Well, I, so, I mean, anything that, that far out, I, I don't trust it's gonna happen after we saw what happened with the even congestion pricing on, on a shorter time frame. But um, so that's why I'm asking about the trends now, but it, it, it sounds like it's, your understanding is it's pretty flat. I think it is. Um, I, I'm not gonna speculate on the numbers, but, um, but you know, it will start to really eat into the amount of gas purchases that that the vehicle electrification is happening. There were we've seen fi about fifty percent year over year growth in EVs the last few years. So, thank you, uh, Charlie. You raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to um, to echo what Christine said and what <clears throat> some of the other uh, committee members have said about free private storage for. Um, personal vehicles and that that's something that we want to discourage. And I just wanted to point out that in, in Hell's Kitchen and, and in much of community before, so much of the parking is alternate side parking where people are storing their vehicle for free and they're moving it once a week, or I guess soon twice a week, and they're moving it for 10 minutes and then they put it back. And maybe they go to uh, on a, you know, a weekend getaway once every three months or something. But just in terms of they're, they're not having a daily need to charge their vehicles because they're storing their vehicles for free on the street and moving them 20 feet once a week. Mm. Yeah, and in fact, if you electrify the curb, um, you can establish potentially better behavior on that too with uh, idle fees. 
And, you know, once a bat battery is full, um, you know, there could be maybe a 10 hour, a 10 hour grace period um, where the, there's no cost, but then maintaining, eating up that, that plug, you know, not at least keeping your car there would have an, an escalating cost, or I'm not sure what the, the mechanism would be, but you could imagine establishing rules that would say that um, the curb has to be better, serves serves the public better by having more churn and, and increasing and add, adding plugs could allow you to establish some of those policies and rules. Jason, I have another question. Um, so I'm surprised that there is not more attention on, you know, the fleets and the trucks and the school buses and sanitation and, you know, the fleet of the city. And is that something that is people are paying attention to yeah. in, uh, yeah. rather than just individual cars, because, you know, as you can guess by now, I don't care about the individual car, but uh, really uh, all these fleets are things we are going to need, right? And, and no matter what we do, and, and in addition to the 20% of people that are going to continue to use their car, the, 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 the workers that come to work with their tools, et cetera. So there, there is a whole level of population that needs, needs a truck, needs a car, needs a bus. What are we doing about, about them? Well, there's a lot of good news there um, at the city and state level. The city has been um, one of the outstanding leaders amongst municipalities, especially large urban municipalities in turn, turning its municipal fleet in, into electric. Um, extraordinary measures led by um, a real hero over at DCAS, uh, Keith Kerman. And they've published studies about how they've shown that they've got lower cost of ownership, lower cost per mile by going electric, even with the higher initial cost. They've um, electrified scores of, of the sedans and, and vehicles in the city fleet that have alternatives that are electric and they're starting to push um, medium and heavy duty truck manufacturers to come up with models that meet some of the other needs. There's already, um, I think six electric refuse collectors running around. I was at the launch of the first battery electric street sweeper and so some of the harder vehicles to, uh, to electrify are starting to get there. Um, DCAS does a fleet show uh, every year and it's very exciting. Um, this is at um, Corona Park at the Unisphere and all the automakers and uh, vendors bring their um, electric and fuel cell vehicles to show off. And it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting what, what's happening in that space. So, there's private fleets and there's public fleets. The public fleet in New York City and New York State are in the process of electrifying. New York mm -hmm. City has been really a leader on this. On private fleets, that has to go. That goes to incentives, and you know, those uh, a small business may not have the capital to to you know upgrade their truck. Um, so even with a lower cost of ownership, if you can make that economic argument, they may not have the ability to do it. So loan loan offers. Um, incentives, grants, things of that nature have to be in place to help encourage that transition because the um, low emission, zero emission, uh, medium and heavy vehicles still have a big cost premium. But, you know, mm -hmm. fleets are doing it and we're we're doing a lot of outreach. We have a program here at NYSERDA called the New York Truck Voucher Incentive Program, NYT VIP. And that provides, um, that covers the entire incremental cost uh, between a diesel vehicle and an electric vehicle. So if a, when a fleet and private fleet is ready to make that purchase of a new vehicle, they can choose an electric because we'll cover, we'll, we'll erase that cost differential and, and things like that have to continue to happen. Jason, uh, so I'd like to wrap it up and th thank you very much, Jason. That was a whole education and on a hot subject where we are not all in agreement. Um, I, I wanted to see whether, if I if I would summarize a, a result, if if we want to say something, and clearly there is a sense that there are not enough chargers, right? And it seems that we are not all in agreement of where they should be. It seems that though there is somewhat of an agreement that if we had more level three chargers in parking and there were more incentive for parking lots to get equipped like that 
we would alleviate the problem and maybe let's not talk about the curb right now, but at least that, that group would be getting more in the mode of what we are all in agreement that, you know, it looks more like a gas station and you don't have to do everything else. And if there were many more of those, maybe we would be in a good place. So I don't know whether you, everybody is in agreement. I mean, I, I would say that we would want to have those, uh, th those station upgraded and made more available at lower cost. And, uh, and, and that would, I wouldn't go any further than that if, if we wanted to have a letter going to your organization or the DOT or anything. And if we don't want to, then we don't have a letter, that's fine. It's I mean, <clears throat> I would just suggest some language instead of like, because I mean, are there, are there hard costs already associated with these, char these charging stations or is it maybe just a more equitable access to high level charging. Yeah, I, I share that goal 100%. And, you know, I, I didn't talk about this, but <clears throat> there's, um, uh, I'll be brief, there, there was a program that was approved by the regulator in the New York Electric and Utility Regulator uh, in 2020. It's called the Make Ready Program, which provides um, cost relief for electrical system upgrades to serve charging stations. They provided about $500 million for this to all of the, the large utilities in, in the state um, in, in accordance to their, roughly to their service territory populations. So every, so Con Ed got their piece and they have a number of uh, uh, plugs, charging stations that are associated with that with that funding. It doesn't provide money for the charging stations themselves. It provides money for the upgrades. Uh, Con Ed's had their doors knocked down with applications for for charging stations, level two and and fast charging level three. There's an enormous amount of charging in the pipeline. That that's real. That's that's I'm I'm in conversation with Con Ed all the time, and and they've got a lot of um, applications for that make ready funding and projects that are in various stages of development. And there's more money that's gonna to continue to come to get rolled out through 2025. So there is more charging coming to New York. It's of every type of variety and it's in different locations. The charging stations, they're getting fast charging applications. They're more in Brooklyn and Queens um, than there are in Manhattan, which is reflective of the cost um, to build and to operate. But there's a lot of level twos coming, and 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 that's from private developers. There's also the city's efforts to do more. Um, city's done fast charging hubs. They did one in Essex and Delancey. Um, they did they did another one in um, Williamsburg. They're doing one in every borough, and and then there will be more. So there's there's more coming, and um, and I I would I would strongly um, agree with uh, the notion of you know advocating for more equitable access. Okay. So I don't know, do we want to do something like that or do we want to wait and have Con Ed come over or whatever and, and write a letter or, you know, what, what, what is the best way to do that? I'm open to suggestion. Tina, you were um, waiting. I'll say one thing, there's a, there's a proceeding right now with, with the utility, with the um, Department of Public Service and their um, in the process of developing new tariffs for fast chargers, because the cost that fast charge operators, owners of fast charge stations pay for their utility, for their electricity is very, very, very high. That's why there aren't as many of them as we'd like. So there's a proceeding right now in which they'll eventually come up with an order creating new tariff structures that will lower the cost. That's going to, if you pay, if, if you, you know, this is something that you can, um, tune into and subscribe and follow. And there's gonna be a public comment period when, when the proceeding um, produces its white paper, which is gonna be its proposal. And uh, that is a really good opportunity to weigh in and provide some thoughts to on the record um, for an important ongoing proceeding. I can give you the- um, Jason, would you be able to forward us that, those details to the office so we can- Yeah. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really helpful. But uh, going back to Tina, Tina, you had like 
<laughs> so well, I was going to say I can, I would make a motion to write a letter, but that's not necessarily committable as to location. But I don't think anybody's. I don't. I wouldn't even know what to say about that. But that would um, keep us in the loop in terms of being informed and let them know that we want to be informed and we want to keep our finger on the pulse and in, and ensure that there is equitable access, which I think is the most important factor. Um, yeah, the concern I have with equitable access and just staying with that word is that that's going to translate into uh, curb charging. And, and, and yeah, because curb charging is right now the quickest way to do equitable access. It's but, like in, in Manhattan, right? I'm not talking about because it's, it's you know, it's free. Um, but if we have, I mean. I so that's why I would, I would be advocating for, you know, upgrading the level two to level three in the garage and giving incentives to the garage to create a system like gravity. I mean, you know, I thought the gravity system was very interesting. And, and that now you have a model which looks like and smells like a gas station where you don't have to pay the parking, you know, and you don't have to spend three, four hours. So to me, to me that's the system that replicate the most what we have today, which is equitable and which is, you know, and that's possible. I mean, as long as it's achievable. Well, the gravity system is going to do that. The question is whether you know the nicer or the uh, the state or the city could um, direct uh, grants and funding and incentive for them to do that. Everybody who has level two start to reconfigure themselves to do more level three. You know. And then you pay for yeah, half an hour of parking without even having to change anything, right? Right. But Jason, were you saying that Con Ed is the one who is channeling those loans or, or grants? Yes, the program is called Power Ready. There's, it's the Con Ed Power Ready program, and each utility has a program that they've developed from the from the DPS order, the Make Ready order, which right. enabled all of this funding for charging stations. And the charging station money comes with incentives to encourage public accessibility. They have a um, a greater incentive, a higher incentive for publicly accessible. Um, a lower incentive for stations that require mm -hmm. uh, payment, like a like a parking fee. So there are some um, there's some logic built into the program. But yes, you can talk to Con Ed about their Power Ready program and how it's going, and and that that would get you a lot of good information. That's great, David. And you should talk to the city too, may, the MOS about where what their plans look like for for charging. Okay. I have a two pronged idea. I don't know if it'll work, it might be a flop. One is put a certain amount of free charging stations in NYCHA, where the NYCHA, because there's a lot of parking in the NYCHA park. The other thing is a lot of times, and affordable housing, a lot of times people come before our committee, there's a state law where they're required to have a certain amount of parking. They try to get a waiver or they try to do these spots. But when they come across, we we'll say, okay, you have to give us these charging stations for the public. You know, not just for your residents, even at the high cost, like these luxury uh, houses that were built in Hudson Yards or Chelsea. Obviously, that, that ship is left, but something like that, when they're building their underground garages, they have to put charging stations in and accessible to the public, maybe. We could do that. This, yeah. yeah, that's just my idea. We could throw that around. Take a look at Local Law 130, which is in progress in New York uh, City. Um, which is going to require, uh, it's already has, some part of it has come into effect. I know they're looking at strengthening it. It's, it requires um, new construction of, of parking facilities to have a number of spaces allocated to charging stations. Um, but, you know, you have to eventually go beyond that to have retrofits and, and require 
require a retrofit so that more stations start to show up. But well, if there being tax breaks from the city or state, they say if you want to continue with that, you have to do put this in. That's how you can retroact. Otherwise, yeah. when you expire, we're not going to renew it unless you do this and give everyone access, not just the corporate executives. Yes, that's right. And and I'll yeah, yeah. Okay, Viren and, and we'll close. Yeah, uh, so very quickly, um, David NYCHA is not exactly a kind of necessarily a dumping ground for everything we don't want anywhere else. NYCHA has its their own fleet of vehicles and trucks and um uh, He's talking about the residents. Um the residents, yes. The residents have their own parking, and that's okay. Right. For other people to have access to their parking, to, I mean, the charging um, stations would be asking for a bit much because okay. NYCHA is required to also uh, do that for their own fleet of vehicles, both from NYCHA maintenance point of view and uh, NYCHA residence point of view. But Christine, I just want to kind of take up uh, that issue about whether we should write a letter now or shall we wait to hear from Con Ed and City first? Because we might actually benefit a lot more in terms of what to say and what to write after hearing them rather than writing something now, because there's a lot of work that's being done um, okay. as well. So I think, um, yes. I'm good, good with I'm good with that. I mean, we are just touching the top of the iceberg. Yeah. We, we are just learning. Uh, and and we have a lot to learn before yeah. we speak yeah. up about anything. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's okay with that. All right, Jason. Thank you so much for all your knowledge and your patience and uh, this very very good discussion. Thank you. I, I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, thank you for for uh, having us. Okay. Reach out if you have any questions. Yes, we will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Okay, sorry, thank you for everybody being uh, patient. We have the next subject is MTA to present on West 14th Street, ADA construction and give an update on West 28. Evening, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. So tonight we're just gonna give you a presentation out at our presence is beginning to be felt um, in CB4 and CB5 uh, regarding the ADA improvements at 14th Street, both 7th Avenue, 6th Avenue, and some ancillary work um, at 1st and 3rd Avenues on the L line. Um, I just want to just mention that I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Joel Donnell from MTA Capital Constructions on the call, um, my other colleagues from uh, Government Relations at uh, New York City Transit, um, Luke De Palma, and you all know Ernest uh, is on the call as well. So, but the real the real thing is we're gonna go through the presentation and uh, of course we'll ask, you can ask all the questions that you like uh, following. And I'm gonna introduce Michael Murphy, who is the project uh, CEO for, or project um, lead for Sitnolta Construction, who's gonna be doing the work uh, for this important ADA project, um, something that community, this community board, as well as community boards throughout the city have been asking for for a number of years. And I'm just really happy that we can actually deliver on that. So I'm going to share my screen now and introduce Mr. Murphy to go through the presentation. And I'll start my share there. Okay, Michael, you're on. All right, very good. So good evening, all. Um, so yes, I am Michael Murphy. I'm the senior project manager representing Sinalta Forte JV. Um, this project is very exciting. We are bringing ADA accessible stations to the one, two, three on the seven line, uh, the F and M and the L at Sixth Avenue station. Uh, next slide. Okay, now, forgive me. This is the first time I'm doing this. There we go. There we go. All right, great. So um, schedule. So this is a 33 month uh, duration. We were awarded the contract in December of 2021. Um, it's a six, we're into six months of design. We have a small presence in and around the stations. You may have seen us uh, doing some test pitting and some um, exploratory work within the stations. One month for mobilization. 
um, that pro that time period is now. We're starting to mobilize in the streets. Uh, we have 24 months for construction where we will have a heavy construction presence, and then two months for remaining construction activities where it'll just be some some moderate to little uh, activity out in the field uh, and punch list activities. Next slide. So as I touched on, mobilization at the northeast corner of 14th and 6th uh, is starting now uh, or started earlier this month. Um, we anticipate heavy excavation starting on or around uh, July 6th of this year. Installation of the elevator shafts is going to take place in November of this year. And completion for Milestone 1 is December 1st of 2023. The southwest corner is uh, at 14th and 7th. That's that compromises, or that, that includes Milestone 2. Work at that location is going to also start um, this month. Uh, heavy excavation is going to start in July, wrapping up December 29th of next year. And uh, Northwest Corner, 14th and 6th, again, starting in June. A little bit later on the heavy excavation will be August of this year, and uh, completion of that corner will be June of 2024. Next slide. So to explain the milestones a little bit, this is 14th, uh, 14th Street and 6th Avenue. So milestone one is on the right-hand side. So that's the uh, northeast corner of 14th and 6th. That area is going to receive a new stair, S13, one uh, three-stop elevator, um, which is going to go from street down to upper mezzanine and lower mezzanine, and as well as um, some stair rehabilitation work. On the other side of the street, on the west side, uh, very similar activities, another three-stop elevator to service from street to the two mezzanines, as well as a new staircase. Next slide. So as I spoke about briefly before, some of the activities that you may have seen us doing out in the field right now is some test pitting. So um, this test pitting is to locate and identify existing utilities out in the street. Um, Going through the sequence, you know, we've uh, had to relocate the bus stop. We actually did some concrete pouring last Friday on that activity. So getting into this, uh, getting into this work very early in the job is hopefully going to help us later on by identifying all the utilities. We can finalize our design. So when we boots on the ground, we know what we're going to find. Next slide, please. The utility relocation phasing um, in this area is, is um, a little is going to be sequenced very carefully. So we'll be starting with the, uh, we'll be starting area number one in the orange, which is um, elevator 614 area, uh, followed by uh, the magenta color for 613. Then we're going to be going over to the corner in the green, which is going to be for the new staircase. And then the major utility relocation work we have is for the milestone three work. Uh, that area over there is for elevator 612, um, there's uh, Con Edison Power, there's um, Verizon, ECS, there's DEP water main and sewer work over that, in that corner. So that area is, um, is pretty congested. Milestone one for the Northeast corner. So the work in this corner is gonna include the refurbishment of existing stairs. We have the new elevator 611, uh, which I said before is giving access from street down to the two mezzanines. The new street stair on the North East corner. We also have the new elevator 609, which will provide access from the lower mez to the L platform. 614 elevator, which is going to go from the uptown, um, is going to feed the uh, uptown upper mezzanine to the FM lower, and also um, the FM northbound mezzanine and uptown platform is going to receive new concrete topping, new platform edging, warning strips, and lighting. Next slide, please. So uh, milestone one for the 6th Avenue uh, stair construction work. So this slide is representing the new is in green, the red is refurbishment. So the project includes the new stair S13, but many stairs from street down to mezzanine are gonna be refurbished, which includes, um, which includes new uh, tile walls, new handrails, new K rails, new lighting, uh, as well as uh, new stair treads. Next slide, please. So milestone one MPT at the Northeast corner for 14th and 6th. Obviously we have some major construction activities that are gonna be taking place. So our MPT factors in the rerouting of pedestrians. So in yellow, 
we are going, that is the new pedestrian path. And in the red box represents our construction areas. So working with DOT and our stipulations will provide um, adequate protection to the public and we'll route them around our construction areas. Um, also on the Northeast corner is um, for when we start elevator 611 work on the right hand side, you can see our MPT area grows in that area. So, um, uh, so we can get the pedestrians around the deep excavation for elevator 611. Next slide. And that deep excavation that I was just referring to is represented in this slide. So the dark gray is the existing MTA structure. Uh, the light gray and blue uh, represents what we need to construct on this project. So it's roughly a 33 foot deep excavation where we'll, we'll be doing an extension to the lower uh, mezzanine, the upper mezzanine, as well as um, as well as the street uh, uh, the street construction. Milestone two brings us to Seventh Avenue, which is the one two three line. So work at this corner is um, we're going to be on the corners of Twelfth Street, Thirteenth Street, and Fourteenth Street, all along Seventh Avenue. We have refurbishment of the existing stairs. We have one new uh, street elevator, elevator six fifteen. We also have a new stair um, S5 from street down to upper mezzanine. We have two staircase, uh, two elevators, six, uh, 16 and 617, which will bring you from the mezzanine down to the uh, two island platforms. <clears throat> the passageway uh, between 7th Avenue and 6th Avenue stations is gonna be made ADA accessible. Right now it's a very steep ramp. And uh, both the southbound and northbound platforms are also going to receive new concrete topping, edges, warning strips, and lighting. Test pitting that was completed as of last week uh, are all three of these locations in yellow, in orange rather. Uh, so we identified un underground utilities and we're working on finaliz finalizing our design now. <clears throat> The phasing for our uh, utility relocation will be uh, the orange, the magenta, and then the green. Uh, we're currently working with DOT to get permitted in this area and uh, work in this area is gonna start, as I said earlier, um, later this month. So milestone two MPT on the Southwest corner. So this is gonna be for, on the left-hand side, is gonna be for elevator 615, the street to mezzanine elevator. So again, our MPT is gonna take the public out into the roadway, protected of course, and around our work areas. The two, are, the two red rectangles are, um, are areas that we're reconstructing existing stairs. So we'll have uh, some uh, tight board fencing barriers up on the sidewalk and we'll, we'll perform that work. Next slide. Um, Again, touching on the many stairs that we are gonna be re rehabilitating. So S5 is a brand new stair adjacent to elevator 615. And we have S7 and S6, which will receive uh, um, new stair treads, new handrails, new wall tiles, and new lighting. Next slide. <clears throat> and 12th Street and 13th Street, there's four additional stairs that'll be renovated. Next slide. Milestone three brings us back to um, 14th and 6th. Very similar to what I explained earlier with Milestone 1, uh, we're just on the other side of the street, so we'll be constructing uh, the new Elevator 612 as well as the new Stair S12. We have the elevators that go from the um, mezzanines down to platforms, Elevator 609 and 610, and uh, we'll also be renovating the F&M um, platforms to receive new concrete topping, new edging, uh, warning strips, and lighting. Milestone three, this is what our MPT in the area is going to look like on the left, left in the middle of the page is the new stair and new elevator. Uh, so we'll be routing the people around in the MPT area and in the upper right, um, that's our MPT area. Uh, that's our MPT area for elevator 613. Again, with um, there's many, many stairs, as I said, so 14th and 6th intersection, we have two rehab stairs and one new, and 14th and 16th and 6th, there's four existing stairs that will be renovated. 
The state of good repair is also included uh, on the L line from 1st Avenue up to 8th Avenue. We have structural steel repairs. Uh, we have steel beams that are gonna be replaced, column replacements and repairs. There's a uh, state of good repair on the concrete uh, within the tunnel structure. Um, this work is going to be geo dependent and this work is gonna start January of 23 and go through June of 2024. <clears throat> Some photos of current work that uh, you may or may not have seen out in the area. So uh, this is uh, the upper mezzanine on the, on the left-hand picture it represents uh, some column chopping to expose deteriorated steel to see uh, the extent of the damage. Uh, also um, exploratory borings have been taken for elevator 611 and 612 so we could identify and locate top of rock, water intrusion in the area so we can anticipate what kind of dewatering and supportive excavation work we have upcoming. Um, <clears throat> our project working hours as stipulated is 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. We do have continuous operations that'll be going 24 hours a day within the barriers inside the station. Next slide. So we understand a major active, major construction project like this is uh, gonna impact the public, but some, imp some uh, uh, ways of mitigating this is uh, directional signage, timely posting uh, of staircases and impacts to the public, um, maintaining adequate walking surfaces and uh, proper visibility around barricaded working areas. Next slide. Um, of course, with all of our street work, uh, proper flagging, dust control and monitoring. Um, we have uh, housekeeping and cleanliness on site and noise and vibration monitoring. Um, <clears throat> always we have, uh, we'll be securing the site to eliminating any trespassers, uh, physical barriers around all of our work zones to protect the public and keep them out, uh, maintaining adequate illumination throughout any of the stations and uh, maximizing the effectiveness of our field labor with uh, engineering. And that's to the test pitting that I was talking about earlier. And any questions or concerns, uh, it's Marcus Books contact information is there. And we'll also set up a 24 seven hotline with the 1-800 number. And that wraps up if there's any questions. Okay, maybe you want to leave the, the slide in case there is a question related to that. Any hands raised? No? Oh, Tina has her hand raised. I just one question. I start getting hives whenever I see service disruption. And you put in one of your slides notification of service disruption. So what do you anticipate the disruption to be in for how long? So uh, Marcus, you tell me, do you want me to handle the questions? And unless I, and... Uh, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. fine. So uh, yes, uh, that was Tina, right, who asked the question. So service disruptions, I spoke to all of the platforms, the F and M, the L, as well as the one, two, three, are going to receive new platform edging, new concrete topping, uh, new steel work and new lighting. That's what I'm referring to when I say service disruptions. Obviously those activities will require uh, train service to be out of, uh, trains to be out of service for us to conduct that work. Okay, I'm sorry, but could I get some more specifics other than that? I mean, if I'm an L train rider or whatever, what are we talking about for how long? Uh, well, we have a complete geo schedule that brings us through from January of 2023 all the way through June. Um, the L line, the L line tunnel uh, will have a service disruption twice a month from January through June of 2024. And if I wanted to see the posting of planned service disruptions, where would I go? I think the best the best place would be to be our, our website. You know, I, I think I think what you have to assume is that the work that's going to be disruptive to the station platform edges and 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 concrete work and that stuff will probably require what's called a general order, which is basically an outage or a service diversion on primarily on the weekends and the overnights. Once uh, we get going, we'll have a schedule of uh, when those will take place. We anticipate they will take place, but these things are always subject to change. 
but you can anticipate work that's directly affecting, you know, the, the platforms to occur during the nights and the weekends. I can get you some more information about, you know, what we forecast, but, you know, forecast is really not set in stone because these things change depending on uh, other work that's taking place in the system. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a few questions. This is a lot to absorb here. So um, you said the hours of operation, the hours of work are going to be during the day, except 24 hours operation. So when are those 24 hours and where? Uh, within the stations. So within, within the upper and lower mezzanines of 6th and 14th, which is the L and the F and M, and also the one, two, three, and that'll be behind uh, barriers. You mean within the station and behind barriers? That is correct. That's correct. Okay. All right. So this is not outside. Um, at a point of time, you talked about relocating some utilities, et cetera. Was that on 6th Avenue? That's um, on 6th Avenue, on 14th Street, on 7th Avenue, uh, and on 14th Street at that intersection. And the question was, is it going to be affecting the bike lane, the bike refuge? What is yes. it affecting? So uh, on both avenues, 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue, we will be affecting the bike lane, uh, working with, DO, with uh, DOT and our MPT layouts, we will be relocating the bike lanes. And then when you bring it back, are you going to move some uh, a pedestrian refuge? Uh, I believe we are, yes. And so you will you put it back? Yes, we will. With a tree? Um, no, I, I apologize. We're not affect, no, we're not we're not affecting any any uh, any trees at, at all. Nothing. No refuge. No, 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 refuge. no refuge. No, 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 no. Okay. I apologize. No. Okay. Um, now, I, I should have asked that first. So with this installation, there will be ADA access to every platform. Is that a true statement? Within the 6th, and, within the 6th Avenue station, yes. So 6th and 14th, you'll have access from street to F&M and to L. And at 7th Avenue, you'll have access to the 123. That's correct. So the answer is yes. We yes. will have access directly to all the platforms yes okay great and finally are you going to have working be working around some grades that you have some of those mta uh, subway grades uh you're talking about the the vents at the street level on the side on the sidewalk yes yes, yes the sidewalk vents yes okay because what would be nice is to replace them with brand new vents great vents the only one that the only one that's going to be replaced new is at Eighth Avenue. Um, so Eighth Avenue and 14th Street. There's um, a small amount of waterproofing inside an existing vent that we need to do, and we're, we are replacing that vent. And the rest are going to be remain protected in place. Okay, just because those uh, those grates are really very uh, unpleasant to walk on and. You know they have been here for a long time so that would be a good replacement to do we'd like to ask you to do that it's not the part of the, it's, it's <laughs> go ahead go ahead mike right. i'm sure that's something that can be discussed offline I, currently right. it's not included in the scope of right. work no i i imagine i imagine it's it's never never <laughs> included in the scope of work but that's something which has a lot of impact when you are a commuter and you come out on the sidewalk and then you have these horrible grades that, you know, anyway, that you should think about those things when you are putting your scope around the stations. And, um, okay, that's, that's all my questions. Uh, uh, David, do you have a question? Yes, quick follow-up to a question that you actually asked. You relocating the bike lanes. Could you give us details about that? And also when you do do it, can you at least consult the cyclist so we, it's done in a reasonable fashion, not just for paper paper reasons, so we so it's usable for us cyclists? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, uh, there are actually are a couple slides in here that show the uh, the new the new bike path and pedestrian path on uh, sixth and seventh. But yeah, I can find we can find out. Yeah, David, we're gonna have to we're gonna have right we're gonna have to work with DOT on that. Certainly, that's a discussion that we can have. But um, I'm sure that DOT is. I would I would think the DOT is aware of what's necessary to make sure that the bike lanes right. are are usable. Okay, I don't see any other hands, so um, that's good. I think we could uh, write a letter to confirm everything we have heard and to ask that um, uh, some detail that Tina wanted, right? That uh, what are the... the um... Christine, you can send me an email and, and to follow with your follow-up questions and I can get back to you pretty fast and then a letter would, would get back to you. Okay, but I just and, want to confirm the things we have said, which are right. the things. And I also and I also send this uh, this presentation to you uh, to, uh, tomorrow. Right. So that would be the letter. Do we have a motion here? Motion to adopt. Right. Um, second. I second. Okay. Uh, anyone opposed? No. Good. So we'll write a letter about that to you guys. Um, do you have a quick update on the um, West 28 substation? Are you going to get back to us sometime? Oh, no, sure. Sir. Hey, Christine, this is Joe O'Donnell. How are you? And um, yes. uh, thanks for having us tonight, obviously, for the 14th Street update. Uh, but also, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit tonight just um, uh, for a, a preliminary update on West 28th Street. And then obviously, we would be back when we get more information. But as, as you know, um, we have been uh, socializing the um, uh, re-emergence of the West 28th Street substation project. We've spoken uh, with the Penn South board, uh, the elected officials in the area, and then obviously um, you um, and Dale, uh, we met with uh, the elected officials, Penn South board again, and you all out on the street at West 28th Street to sort of walk through uh, what the plan is for the substation there, um, for the edification of everybody else on the call who was not involved in those discussions or that sidewalk, um, you know, this is a project that is to provide additional power capacity um, so that we would be, um, the, we would have the ability to run more trains more frequently uh, as a result of the innovations and the, the benefits brought on by communications-based trade control on the 8th Avenue line, um, which is currently being advanced between 59th Street um, and High Street in Brooklyn. So we are presently um, advancing the design or finalizing the design for that. As you know, when we were out on site, um, you know, we have a pretty good sense of how this project would unfold. Um, we are finalizing the contract documents to put an RFP out um, possibly as early as the end of this week, but certainly by next week in order to get, um, you know, the process going to get contractors um, to respond to the, um, the request for proposals for this project. Um, and the hope is, is that within probably three to six months from that advertisement of that RFP, um, we would be moving towards uh, a notice or, of, of award to a contractor so we could get that work going. Um, once on board, the contractor is obviously going to take, um, you know, in, in a few months to get um, to dot our I's and cross our T's confirm the assumptions that we've made with the design. We would also invite them to bring any innovation or, or best practices and a better way of thinking to delivering this project. Um, and so that would take probably in the neighborhood of three months or so before work would actually get going. So we're looking at sometime probably in early 23 before work would get going on this project. Um, and then the anticipation is it's roughly um, 24 months of street level work between the excavation and the build out of the actual substation, which is gonna be subterranean, mind you. Um, so it will all be underground. Um, and the total project uh, is anticipated to be about 39 months. So there would be 24 months of street level work um, being rolled out in phases, uh, followed by uh, you know punch list items, the completion and build out of the substation underground, which would not be impacted, impacting anyone above ground while we were doing that. Um, 
Uh, and Joe, again, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kristen. But Joe, let me ask a question. There are very few yeah. things we need from you on that, <laughs> but it must be in the RFP that you're going to ask them to have a, a, a noise, a cocoon or a noise mitigation. So is, as, as we is spoke that going of, to be in the RFP or not? Well, so as we spoke about, and the lights are going on and off here. <laughs> um, so uh, as we spoke about out on site, yes, obviously noise mitigation is absolutely going to be a product of this of the RFP and a product of this this project, um, the means and methods of which are still being investigated. And you had been kind enough to provide us with some information and some background on the mitigation measures okay. um, utilized at Hudson Yard. So our contract, our project team has that information, and um, you know. So that's 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 a must, and it cannot be something business as usual as far as noise mitigation, right? So I, I hope this is clearly in the contract. And then the second thing is that the boundary of that digging has to not en encroach to the place where Penn South is planning to build a building. So that's another thing that needs to. So these two things need to be somewhere in the yard. Yeah, there's obviously very close coordination that's going to take place between Penn South. Right. And I just want to make sure that those things are in the RFP and then, yep. then we are not like six months down the road. I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. And like I said, obviously, once we are further along in this process, we're happy to come back with a full blown presentation, much like you saw from Mike tonight on the work that's getting ready to go. For Can you take years. back those two com comments? To absolutely. The no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Thank you so much MTA, Thanks all. for the Appreciate presentation. It. This is a lot to absorb, but that's uh, very, uh, very good. These are things we have been waiting for a long time. So this is exciting. You all have a great evening, and Dale, I'm jealous. Uh, uh, HYHK, thank you for waiting such a long time. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, I am Patty Baltizo, so I'm here from the Hudson Yards Hell's Kitchen Alliance. I'm the Planning and Development Director, and I'm here to talk about a shared street that we would like to put in along um, Bell Abzug Park, which is the park uh, that we maintain and operate. I'm here with um, DOT to ask the committee formally for um, comments and support on this project. Um, I've been here before to talk about sort of similar shared street concepts, but this is like the, the official design we're showing you tonight. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. If you go to the next slide, um, so we're looking at a temporary shared street, which means we are painting the street. We're not doing any um, uh, concrete construction or anything like that. We're doing this on Hudson Boulevard East uh, between 33rd and 35th streets. Um, and that's adjacent to Bell Abzug Park, which is the park that we maintain, um, the number seven train station and many large commercial buildings on the adjacent side. And there's been lots of community outreach. In addition to presentations at our own bid meetings, we've been to this transportation committee a few times and the land use committee to talk about um, what the shared street would do and the benefits to the community. Um, we've also been in close contact with the local property owners that this street would abut, um, including design consultation from the beginning when we first thought about this project and continued input with them on how the street would function and operate um, sort of through time, you know, across various seasons and times of day. Um, you know, as we wanna sort of add layers to this, um, you know, programmatic layers, we'd want to continue to talk with those property owners. So this is block one of the park on the right side, you can see the seven train station um, and um, in the background, all of uh, those big buildings, all office buildings. So the park already is pretty busy, but we see the shared street as a way to expand the public space and make it easier for pedestrians to flow where they need to go and sort of just create a nice, um, like larger safe space for them. The next picture is showing um, a nighttime shot. This is also block one. Lots of people walking and the next shot uh, shows this is uh, an example of a public event that we had. Um, I was standing on what would be the shared street. So the shared street would be right up next to the park. 
And here, this is an overview map. Um, so we have names for all of the sort of sections of the park, starting in the south, it's block one, and then north, block two, block three, block four, block five, block six. Um, blocks one through three are built. Uh, block four is almost finished. Um, you can see it behind some fencing. We hope that it opens this summer. And blocks five and six are in design right now. So there are only two blocks that have adjacent properties that are about to be open and that's block one and block two. So that's why we focused on that. Um, in the future, we may be back here to talk about further um, temporary shared streets where there are buildings, but right now there are just buildings on the Southern portion. If you go to the next slide, it's a close up. Yes. So this is the design of the shared streets. Um, it's called a double chicane. So a, if a car were to drive through here, it would be forced first of all, to go very slow, five miles an hour. And it would also have to make two slight turns. So it would really sort of inhibit any kind of like fast through traffic. Um, the shared street also, um, you can cross as a pedestrian at any point. We're gonna be painting crosswalks at the edges as sort of a, a visual reminder, but a pedestrian could cross at any point. Um, and another feature of this design is both of these buildings have mid-block lobbies, so right in the middle of the block. So um, the bumped out area on the park side, it's if people want to walk, you know, directly into the lobby, they would be able to do that. Um, there, we also included additional sort of other amenities like bike parking. You can see there's a bike corral on the northern portion, and there's some, I don't know if you can scroll on this PDF, Janine, but there's some at the bottom also. It might be cut off. Um, so yeah, there it is right at the bottom. So we wanted to incorporate um, bike parking because we think biking is important. There's also an existing city bike corral on 34th street. And then there's one a little bit further north on 36th street currently, which um, is not part of this design, but is nearby. Uh, so this is how we sort of envision the street working. Um, again, it would be all painted. There would be flexible delineators and planters placed strategically with tables and chairs um, to sort of expand the park, but also let it be functional for people who wanna walk through um, and get where they need to go. Um, and I think I will hand it over to DOT who will um, talk more about shared streets. Thanks. Hi, uh, Jessica Constein. I am the acting deputy director for project delivery and design for the public space unit, DOT. Um, and so this is a rendering that, that HYHK um, put together of the design for Hudson Boulevard East. Um, and then again, next slide, sort of looking at what that looks like in real life. So this is um, a shared street we implemented in Brooklyn on Willoughby Street. Um, and you can see it's our standard DOT toolkit. Um, we've worked with, um, the bid on making sure they have all of our sort of standard um, standard specs. So it's the roadway um, epoxy gravel treatment that indicates to drivers and signals to drivers that this is a special kind of space, standard markings, flexible delineators, planters, bike parking, movable furniture. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, as we've been implementing shared streets, um, really since 2017, um, we have developed the toolkit um, and we've sort of developed um, sort of why we do these things. So a shared street is a roadway designed for slow travel speeds where pedestrians, cyclists and motorists all share the right of way. And so you can see in this photograph, um, it, is a pretty comfortable place to ride your bike, but it also accommodates all of the necessary loading that has to happen on Willoughby Street. Next slide. Um, University Place, um, on University Place between 13th and 14th. Shared streets are typically deployed on low <coughs> vehicle volume and are high pedestrian volume streets. Design The design encourages vehicles to drive five miles per hour through traffic, calming, signage, and usage of distinctive materials, furnishings, and plantings, and other visual cues in the roadway that caution drivers. So this is showing that chicane that Patty was talking about. So you can see how 
cars are forced through the geometry to go a little bit slower, to go to drive a little bit more carefully through the shared street. Next slide. Shared streets facilitate necessary vehicular access, loading and deliveries, while also creating a vibrant public space for gathering in public events. And so you can see in this, again, um, the chain. So this is um, in the Garment District. This is on Broadway between the 38th and 39th. And you can see how through the chicane and through all of these curb extensions and the change in the geometry, um, we were able to work with the Garment District bid here to really expand public space um, and add amenities to the neighborhood. Next slide. I think that's my last slide. Um, and so with that, I think um, we'll turn it over to you guys for any questions. Okay. Anybody has any question except let's do it. <laughs> I don't see any questions. Oh, yes, Viren. Yeah, very quick question. Are you talking about epoxy gravel treatment for the street? Why not uh, do something a lot more permanent? Similar to cobblestone or something that sort of uh, will reduce the speeds of traffic, but also make it very distinctly clear that it's a very different kind of a street. Why not do that? Um, so sure, I think um, in working with the bid, it's for a couple of reasons. One is um, these are interim. And so we see our interim treatments as ways to really work out these ideas and make sure that they're meeting the needs of the neighborhood before we dive directly into a capital project. That said, we are, um, going on a walkthrough later this summer with Patty to start thinking about how we can start to incorporate these types of elements into um, the construction further north. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the reason why I'm asking you is that that's what we've heard for the last number of years. And none of the streets have actually been turned into permanent shared streets. All along Broadway, we see that. So, you know, why not do something that's actually even environmentally conducive to sort of, you know, having pervious surfaces and what- but, but, Vera, in my, I, I think the, the answer was, was a fair one, which is you want to see if it works and then you move to the next step. And you're right, that's up to us to put that in our budget mm -hmm. and say, we want this capital budget to be put in. And I don't think we have necessarily do, done that because we had so many priorities. So that's, that's a very good thing, but it's a little bit on our back to do that. And I, and I will say, you know, looking at this picture, you know, one of the things that we learned once we implemented the shared streets last summer um, on 20, from 21st to 23rd, 38th to 39th, and then um, 48th to 49th is that um, we actually need more markings, right? So we're actually going back this summer and we're adding markings to these spaces. We're, we're modifying them. So I, our interim toolkit allows us to do, to do that. Uh, I think that's the benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Dale? Um, <clears throat> yes, very much looking forward to sharing this street as I am uh, very close to it. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but what is the anticipated timeline for the next phase? Or do you have one yet? Do you mean for installation or for future shared streets? For the adjacent future ones. Okay, so we are, there's no real timeline. We yeah. have uh, scheduled sort of like a larger meeting to talk with the various parties to see if it's possible, but it's a concept level. It's not, um, there's no like, you know, schedule for construction per se. But we're, okay. we're definitely thinking forward because, you know, the park will expand, Hudson Boulevard East will expand. We see where this could go if, it's, if it works out. So, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that this is like a multi-phase strategic installation. So, yeah. thank you. So, who is, uh, do I have participant? Do I have anybody? Okay. Uh, so, I... You know, seems to be that we 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 like it. We want to do it, and we'd like to have a letter of support. Is that does that is that fair, or do you have a 
I make that motion for the letter of support. Second. Okay. All in. Uh, all. Anybody against? Yeah. No, we're good. Yeah, could we? Could we include in that in that letter that this? It's understood that this is an interim solution. Yeah. Yeah, interim and and um, um, providing an opportunity for uh, assessment. Yeah, and we expect to have at a point of time a conversion to a real one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. and we can. The letter can also point to like what I was mentioning, which is like the multi-phase um, yeah. nature of the of the proposal. That's terrific, Jessica. Thank you so much. We are, as you can see, totally excited, exhausted, but very excited about the project. Thank you for staying so. I'm going to run back home. For right, this and uh, <laughs> appreciate very much. Appreciate that, and and Patty. And one thing that you didn't hear is that the bid is going to build it rather than DOT. So uh, that's a little different than usual, but they are following everything that DOT wants to do. Okay, well, thank you. And the final piece, but not the least, is the uh, wrap up on our use of um, curb use. And I think Blake is going to take us through that. Uh, do we have the presentation, uh, uh, Janine? Uh, yes, give me one moment to pull it up. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jane. Um, you know, I won't really repeat uh, necessarily uh, what we went over last time, but, you know, just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, this was the data from a survey that was launched in April and May uh, of this year, and we see quite a few responses, um, you know, over 700, out of which uh, 400 uh, were associated with the residential zip codes within the uh, community district. Uh, I think these are the... Um, no, that's not this one, um, Janine. Uh, it's the Curb Use Survey 2022 doc. Uh, so in, in any case, um, the survey had asked the respondents to rank the different uses of curb space and split it out between the commercial arterials and the residential streets. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the public transit, uh, pedestrian and bike uses uh, tended to be the most highly prioritized. Uh, and for residential streets, uh, it was MTA bus stops, uh, greenery and bioswales and bike lanes. And then for the commercial side, it was uh, MTA bus stops and bus lanes, uh, followed by greenery and bioswales and bike lanes. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between looking at the citywide results and the results that were specific to uh, the community district. And then on the opposite side of the scale, on the um, low prioritized uh, uses, uh, tour bus stops, uh, NYPD parking, and space for black cars and taxis uh, were low priority for both types of streets. And then uh, we also provided some of the verbatims from the comments, uh, which does illustrate that there is you know, a pretty big split. There were some uh, comments that feel very strongly about uh, the availability of parking, uh, you know, particularly for residents of the neighborhood. Uh, there was also a fair number of comments about the use of space for outdoor dining, uh, you know, which um, was cited as a sanitation concern uh, in many cases. Um, so, you know, uh, let me know if, um, you know, anyone had questions on the data or, you know, I'm sure it's a good place to start a discussion here too. Well, so I, I, I think this was, this is a fantastic summary and, and, and very rich content and, um, the, you know, I don't, I don't know whether we would want with that, um, we want that to be a communication to the board to say, this is what we learn, right? And this is what the community says, or and slash, we want to have a letter going to DOT saying, look, you should be really 
planning the curb, just like we had the discussion about electric charger, I think there is a need to be planning the curb and making sure that at the curb you have the, the, the you know, the services which are necessary. So I'm, I'm totally open to do one or, 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 or the other or both. I mean, one or both to, um, yes, Tina. Also, would, would this be appropriate to put on our website so people can review yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. It's very interesting and very informative. I don't, I mean, I think it be, can be used in so many ways in the future. Right, right. Viren. Yeah, I'm just gonna echo what Tina said. Uh, can it, is it accessible to us, meaning the committee members to start with? We, we send it around, yes. The, the final version of it. Well, this is the final version of it. So we, we have access to that, right? Okay, the second part is, um, I think we should be doing both. We should write a letter to DOT and definitely share it with the board. Okay. Uh, in some form or the other. I kind of agree. I think there are, you know, nobody has ever done that. So this is- Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great mechanism even for DOT to be sort of conducting this kind of surveys. Yes. Break them down, you know, for neighborhoods and districts, right. so that they can actually collect this kind of data before moving forward with any large, um, large scale sort of changes. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so let's let, let me pick that up. Is that so? It would be a, a resolution to, I mean, you know, directed to one directed at the board and one directed at DOT, and which is talking about the results, and you know, generally to make sure that they are informed. I mean, they are planning properly and they are informing. There is so much, you know, contest at the curb. And then that they are uh, also for the board that we are taking in account those priorities as we are making decision going forward. Okay. 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 Sorry. Blake, so that sounds good with you. Yeah, happy to draft you know letter uh, okay. summarizing the survey and the findings. Yeah. And was okay. not um, were not uh, EV charging stations one of the uh, items to be considered? They are in there, right? Yeah, so we're full circle tonight. Right. <laughs> okay. Anybody has uh, opposed this motion or no? We're good. That's it. So Blake, yeah, if you could draft a resolution, that'd be awesome. Yep, yeah, we'll do. Thank you so much. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I, I had one really quick, very quick note, new business. Yes, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse said that's it. Really quick. I just wanted to I make everybody aware that, you know, this committee has advocated for um, public elected officials to um, dig into the problem with the helicopters over Manhattan and especially our district. And the state Senate did pass a law that's limited in scope, but it did restrict uh, non-essential uses from the... Um, heliport on the west side, the Hudson, in the Hudson River Park, and it also opened the main mechanism of the legislation opens uh, operators to litigation for excessive noise and quality of life disruptions. So it's 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 not a final um, resolution, but it's a tool in the toolkit towards limiting the number of um, sorties that these helicopters do oh. over our district. And, and, if, and if we do this, uh, the other thing we send is a letter about the uh, definition for idling, you know, to, not to change. And on that front as well, we were uh, successful and uh, the D, uh, Department of... Uh, DEP. DEP, right? I, I all, I'm always confused about this, this one. <laughs> DEP issued a new definition, which is very close to what we had recommended. So I think, I think that's, these are, these are really a great accomplishment lately. That's great. Okay. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Motion good night, all. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.